Thanks for joining us in the next message in this series of Radical Faith. Tonight we're going to talk about the woman in the crowd. Let's say our prayer together. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I therefore boldly declare that God loves me, that Jesus died for me, and that the Spirit will guide me in all truth. 
I come now to hear God's holy word. I will let it be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, that I might be everything God created me to be in Jesus' name. Tonight we're going to look at a story that's found in Mark chapter 5. If you have your Bibles at home, you can open up and follow along with us. Or if you have the sheet that we've given you for a study guide, you can follow with us as well. The Bible tells us, beginning in verse 24, a huge crowd followed Jesus and pressed Him on every side. In the crowd was a woman who had been suffering from a chronic bleeding for 12 years. Although she had been under the care of many doctors and had spent all of her money, she had not been helped at all. Actually, she had become worse. And since she had heard about Jesus, she came from behind in the crowd and touched His clothes. She said, if I can just touch His clothes, I'll get well. There are a lot of people that need this kind of faith. They need the faith of this woman that's in the crowd because she desperately needed God's help. But so many people are reluctant to reach out to God for help. And what we want to do tonight is we want to look at how that you and I can have faith when we are hurting. Let's look at that tonight. How do you have faith when you're hurting? There are a lot of people that experience this, especially during this difficult time. And so what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about how we can have that kind of faith. First of all, we need to tear down the barriers to faith. There are a lot of barriers that we naturally put up that keep us from having the kind of faith that we need to actively be exactly what God wants us to be. When we look at this lady's story, we see a number of things that are present that tell us about some of the barriers that she had to overcome in order to do what she did. I love the story when it's in the old King James. It said, she touched the hem of his garment. And that was a specific statement that relayed all of the faith that this woman had. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be healed. And so she had a tremendous faith. But there were barriers that she had to overcome. And they're given to us in this narrative as we look at it. So the first barrier that she had to overcome was she felt lost in the crowd. The scripture says a large crowd, a huge crowd followed Jesus and pressed him on every side. Can you imagine he's walking along and he's just got people all around him. Everyone is pressed against him. And the scripture says she was lost in this crowd. As a matter of fact, she had spoken to herself and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, how I'll be changed, how I'll be healed. But she had to come in, the scripture says, from behind. She had to worm her way through this crowd. Sometimes you and I feel lost in the crowd. In Psalm 34 and verse 18, the scripture says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. If you're following along, I'd like you to circle that word close. The word close there in the Hebrew is the word orab. Now, this word is a unique word that is used in the context of three ways. It is used in the context of being near in placement. In other words, I am near to this table. This is near to me. It's near in placement. The second way that this word is used is near in relationship. We know that the Lord is near us. Numerous places in the scripture, it tells us that God is near us. He is beside us. As a matter of fact, we know that He is omnipresent and He is constantly near us. More importantly, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He dwells within you. So He's not just near you, He's in you. But here, the second way this word is used is close or nearness in relationship. In other words, he is a close relative to me. He is someone who is blood relative to me. That's the term that is used here. The third thing is it says he is close or he is near to us in time. You ever feel that way? You feel like I know God's with me, but I don't feel him right now. Well, this word eliminates all of that guessing. It eliminates all of that doubt. Because the Bible says the Lord is close. He is near to us. He's close to us in place, in relationship, and in the time in which we are living. He is close to us when we are brokenhearted. And without a doubt, this lady was brokenhearted. 
And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. She was at the end of all that she had been through. And yet she felt so pressed. She was lost in the crowd. She felt, if I can just weave through this crowd, maybe I'll get a chance to experience Jesus. There are a lot of people that feel that way. I'm just in the crowd. And why would Jesus take notice of me? But I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And that's what she did. I love this passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 10. The Scripture here says, For even if the mountains walk away and the hills fall to pieces, my love won't walk away from you. My commitment of peace will not fall apart. The God who has compassion on you says so. Two words there I want to draw your attention to. The first one is the word love. That word love is the word chesed. In the Hebrew, it is often translated loving kindness. He said, my loving kindness, the very essence of my mercy and what I bestow upon you because of my great love, it will not walk away from you. Secondly, he says, my covenant commitment of peace. That word peace is the word shalom. You've heard that word before. He says, my covenant commitment of peace. In other words, I've made a commitment to you. My peace won't fall apart. And so we have God's promise that even though we feel lost in the crowd, His love will never walk away from us. And His covenant commitment of peace won't fall apart. And God, who is compassionate, is the one who has made this statement. So to tear down the barriers that you and I have to faith, we first have to understand we need to overcome that sense of isolation. We are not alone. God is always with us and near to us. The second one that we've got to overcome is the essence of time. In other words, it's been so long. The Scripture says for 12 years. I know there are people that are listening and that say, well, I've prayed about this for years and years and years and years. When is God going to do something? You're not alone. There were people in the Scripture that had to wait a long time for God to manifest Himself and answer a prayer and do something in their hearts and lives. You are among some of the greatest people of faith in the Bible. When I look in the Bible, I see how Moses had to wait 40 years before God really began to use him. And then we look at Abram, Abraham, how long he had to wait till he was 100 years old to have that son of promise that God had given him. He had to do that. And so we look through the Scriptures and we understand that there were individuals that had to wait a long time for God to really intervene and do something. One of those men was David. David had been ruthlessly pursued by King Saul. He was under the death threat constantly. He was always in hiding. He was always having to go into situations and circumstances where he didn't have any security or peace or safety. And there's a passage of Scripture that David wrote about those years that he was in hiding, constantly being pursued by his enemy. It's in Psalm 35 and verse 17. And David said, God, how long are you going to stand there and do nothing? Save me. He wanted God to do something. How many times have we said, God, how long is it going to take for you to do something? The important thing for you and I is to understand that when we feel like it's been such a long time since we've been praying about this and we need this great event to take place, we want to have the faith to see this happen. We need to understand we're in good company. I love this passage of Scripture that's in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. Habakkuk had great faith. And he made this bold statement. He said, but uh, he listened to God as God gave him some hope in the midst of his circumstances. God said to him, these things that I plan, God had told him great things are going to happen. Habakkuk said, yeah, when? He said, these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair. When it seems like it's been a long time, don't despair. For these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. And they will not be overdue a single day. If you and I are going to overcome the barriers and tear down the barriers to our faith, we need to overcome that barrier of loneliness and not feel lost in the crowd. We need to overcome that barrier of time and patience. And do not be discouraged or in despair. Here's the third thing. Sometimes we get disappointed. 
She was extremely disappointed. You've got to break down this barrier. Although she had been under the care of many doctors, the Scripture says she had not been helped at all. You may have tried thing after thing after thing. You may have prayed prayer after prayer after prayer. You may have been through every circumstance you can think of. And we have a tendency, because we're human, to become very disappointed. I love this passage uh, here that's given unto us. It's of the Hebrew children in the book of Daniel, found in Daniel chapter 3. I love this passage. They had gone before King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had erected this huge golden statue and said, everyone must bow down to me and they must worship me as a god. And these three Hebrew children decided they were not going to do that. You know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so these three men stood up and he said, because you have defied me, I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And here's what they said. If we are thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. And He will deliver us out of your hand. They made sure that His deliverance would be from this king's hand, regardless of how they were delivered. But He will deliver us. And He said, Your Majesty, but if He doesn't, please understand, sir, that even then, we will never, under any circumstance, serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have erected. Sometimes you and I have got to put our foot down and just make a declaration of faith that even if God doesn't answer my prayer, that's not going to change my spirit, my heart, my belief in God. It's not going to change the circumstances of my life. You know how many people have walked away from their faith and walked away from Christianity because things got a little hard and God didn't answer prayers the way they thought or they woke up one day and didn't feel like they were spiritual or something? Get a life! Get a life! These people in the Bible, they experience far worse than you have experienced and you want to walk away from God? You just want to walk away from church and God's people? You and I need to understand that even when we're disappointed, we need to have the faith that the Hebrew children had. That even if God doesn't do what we expect Him to do, we still won't bow. We still won't worship the other people. We will not burn because God is with us. The next thing that you and I have to face is the same thing that she faced. I don't have any more resources. Sometimes we've expended all of the resources that we have in our lives. We are not able to provide for the situation that's at hand. We wonder how God is going to do something mighty in our lives. The scripture says she spent all of her money. She had spent everything that she had. She must have just barely subsisted. Well, the scripture says again in Habakkuk, when God had said to Habakkuk earlier, he said, listen, you just need to be patient. What I tell you is going to happen, it'll happen when I want it to happen. <clears throat> it must have infused him with great faith and power. Look what he writes. He said, even though the fig trees are destroyed. Now, all of these are monetary crops or monetary elements in an agrarian society, which is all they had. They didn't have jobs like you and I have. And so he said, if all the fig trees are destroyed, and there's neither blossom left nor fruit, though the olive crops fail and the fields are barren, even if the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, he says, yet will I reckon, will rejoice in the Lord. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will be happy in the God of my salvation. He had that same kind of faith that the Hebrew children had. He said, even if I lose everything that is of monetary value to me, everything that is providing me with financial security, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. You've got to overcome that obstacle that's there. You think God can't do something because you don't have the resources to do it. You've got to break past that. Here's the next thing. Things get worse. <laughs> How many of y'all have noted in your life that when you are going through a difficult circumstances, it sometimes gets worse before it gets better. Amen? And that is exactly what she experienced. 
The scripture there said she had not been helped at all. Actually, she had become worse, but she overcame this barrier. The scripture here says in Job chapter 19, and I love this passage, Job again exemplifies this type of faith that she had. He said, my best friends abhor me. Those I loved have turned against me. I am skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. All oh, my friends, pity me, for the angry hand of God has touched me. Why must you persecute me as God does? Why aren't you satisfied with my anguish? Oh, that I could write my plea with an iron pen in the rock forever. But then he makes this bold statement. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth at last. And I know that after this, Body has decayed, this body shall see God. You ever wonder, you go through the books of the Old Testament and say, where is Jesus in this book? Where is Jesus mentioned in this book? Where is Jesus manifested in this book? In the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, we see Jesus Christ mentioned here in Job 19 and verse 25 where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Even though he felt discouraged, even though he had been through terrible circumstances and he had lost everything and then lost his health and his friends had begun to pick on him and point out all of his failures in life, he said, I could do all of that. He said, but I would write this down with an iron pen on a rock forever. I know my Redeemer lives. You got to overcome the obstacles in faith. So the first thing we need to do is you and I need to tear down the barriers. Second thing, you got to take a step of faith. At some point, this woman had to make a decision that she was going to work her way up through the crowd. No matter how people uh, ostracized her and turned her aside, she was an individual that said, you know what, I've got to take this step of faith. And that is the beginning of God's working in your life when you take a step of faith. If all you do is sit on your rear end and you don't do a thing for God, and you never take that step of faith to do or become something for God, you will never amount to anything for God. If you are going to have the kind of faith that you need to see God do mighty works, you have got to take that first step. It all begins with the first step. The scripture says here in Mark chapter 5, since she had heard about Jesus, she came from behind in the crowd and touched his clothes. She said, if I can just touch his clothes, I will get well. She had that faith that she could just move through the crowd. I love this passage in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. The scripture says, and now, just as you trusted Christ to save you. Did you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did you believe that? You, you believe that he saved you. Just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust Him too for each day's problems. Think about that. Every day you have a problem. I don't know about you, but I got problems every day. We all have problems each day. And the scripture says, for each day's problems you need to trust Him. Live in vital union with Him. I circled that on my paper, each day's problems. I looked it up. And it literally translates, walk with him beside you every day. In other words, when you're going through these difficulties and you're facing these problems in your life, don't treat God as if he's not there. Don't treat Jesus as if he's absent from the circumstance. He's right here. Walk with him. Be in vital union with him. <coughs> you and I need to bear that in mind and take it to heart. In this passage of scripture that she gave us there in Mark chapter 5, verses 27, 28, I, I looked at some observations. First of all, it says she heard about Jesus. The first step of faith, you and I need to take steps of faith. The first step of faith is I choose to listen to the truth about Jesus. <clears throat> you know, you are what you feed yourself. If all you do is read junk, you become junk. If all you do is read criticisms of Christ and criticisms of the Bible and criticisms of God, you won't have any faith 
Because you're destroying the very essence of your faith. You've chosen to listen to untruth instead of listen to truth. And the scripture says she had heard about Jesus. And the context of that was that she knew he was someone who could help her. He was someone who healed. He was someone who saved. He was someone who had God's divine power within him. And so she learned to listen to the truth about Jesus. Now, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you went through stages. You may be in one of these stages right now where it comes. Five stages most believers go through in understanding suffering. There are five stages most believers go through in understanding suffering. First of all, you'll think a person living right should never suffer. You know, in our naivety, that's the way we think after we first accept Christ. Because after all, when you accept Jesus, everything's a rose garden, right? Everything's perfect. Everything's hunky-dory. Well, it ain't long before you can move out of that into the next stage. The next stage is you come to the conclusion that good people endure hardships, but they always find relief. No. <laughs> They're good people. And they will endure hardships, but sometimes you don't find relief. Amen? Sometimes you just live with that. You live with that circumstance. You live with that pain in your life. The third level is this. God will take my sufferings and use it for good in my life. We all come to that point at some time or another. If you learned Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose... You will trust God that He will take my suffering and He will use it for good in my life. And you think, well, it ends there. No, <clears throat> there's more to come. You move beyond that even. As your faith begins to grow and you begin to understand more about the nature and the essence of suffering, you take it into the next level. The next level is this. Faithful people may be called to suffer for Christ. Paul the Apostle said, I count myself grateful that I can endure suffering just as my Savior endured suffering. There are individuals that God has called to a life of suffering. They live their lives constantly under the elements of pain or handicaps or disabilities or financial woe. God sometimes does call faithful people to suffer for Christ, but the, the apex of the thing that God wants us to learn above all other things is the fifth step. This fifth stage that God wants us to understand is that we would gain an eternal perspective. If you want to write this down, Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. <clears throat> this is the eternal perspective in suffering. Paul the apostle had been talking about suffering he had said, we are joint heirs with Christ, and if we're heirs with His uh, receiving the salvation, we are also heirs in His suffering. And he makes this bold statement in verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. You cannot even begin to compare the glory of what God is going to do in heaven compared to the sufferings that we experience here. God's ultimate objective for us in understanding suffering is that we would gain an eternal perspective. The second step of faith, not just the first step, the first step was choose to listen to the truth. In that next uh, element about it, it says she wanted to understand if I can just touch his garment. She began to think about something. And then the second step of faith, she chose to think about what Jesus can do. She chose to think about what Jesus could do. When you go through this process, you not only get to that point where you think about what Jesus is, and you begin to think about the truth of Jesus, you also need to look at what Jesus can do in your life. Then there's the third step that is mentioned there. She said, if I'll just reach out and I'll touch that garment, she said, I choose to make a commitment of confidence. You've got to go through that process in your life. 
You have got to think about the truth of Jesus. You've got to choose to think about what Jesus can do. And you've got to choose to make a commitment of confidence. You've got to believe that God can do something and will do something for you. The third thing that you and I need to do in our life is we need to tell someone your story of faith. You and I need to tell someone else our story of faith. You say, what do you mean my story of faith? What do you think this woman did after this had happened? Do you think she just kept it to herself and went back and just lived her life the same way she did? No. <clears throat> she had to tell someone about it. As a matter of fact, Jesus prompted her to tell him what had just happened because the Scripture tells us he felt the power flow out of him as someone touched his garment. Now all these people are around him, everybody's touching him, but all of a sudden Jesus stops, stops the whole crowd and says, who touched me? And they're all going, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody <laughs> touched you. <clears throat> he said, no, I felt the power go out from me. Someone touched me in faith. And when he made that statement, he urged them to speak up. Tell me what just happened. She wa he wasn't just saying, who touched me? He was saying, who touched me, why, and what just happened? You need to learn to tell someone your story of faith. Without a doubt, as a, as a pastor, I tell people my stories of faith all the time, but it encourages me greatly when I hear other people tell their stories of faith. How God did something miraculous in their life. How God did something wonderful in their life. How God changed their lives. We need to start telling our story. We need to start sharing our testimonies. Because when you share your testimonies, you have no idea what God is going to do. The scripture here says in Mark chapter 5, she said, if I can just touch his clothes, I will get well. Her bleeding stopped immediately. <clears throat> she felt cured from her illness. At that moment, Jesus felt power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Those three dots there on your paper are where they said, well, who touched you? Everybody touched you. The woman trembled with fear. You know, sometimes we are afraid to share our story. She knew what had happened to her. But Jesus had prompted her to tell what had happened. And so she quickly bowed in front of him and told him the whole truth. Where did she touch him? From behind. Now she had to move around where she could see his face and his eyes. And she had to kneel and bow before him and tell him her story. You ask yourself the question, why did Jesus ask her to speak? He could have just kept walking through the crowd and she would have been healed nonetheless. It didn't make any difference whether she said anything or not. But Jesus wanted her to speak. Why? Because revealing our faith sets us free. When we begin to reveal our faith, it sets us free. I, I hate it when people say, my faith is private. My faith is personal. I keep it to myself. Dear friend, you will never experience the wonder and the power that God can manifest in your life if you don't tell your story. Because revealing our faith sets us free. Look at this passage. Mark 5 verse 34, it says, He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. We've got to tell our story so that it's real. Sometimes we don't even believe it's real until we recognize it's real and declare it's real. And that's exactly one of the reasons why Jesus asked her to speak. My second question is because she trembled with fear. That word fear is the word phobos from where we get the term phobia. And here... It says, why is it frightening to talk about our faith? Why is it frightening to talk about our faith? Well, the reason is, is because it's deeply emotional. When you and I talk about our faith in God and some great story that God has done something in our life, believe it or not, it's deeply emotional to us. There are people that don't like to weep, but they'll weep when they tell their story. There are people that are afraid that someone will disbelieve them 
Or maybe they'll make fun of them. Or they'll say, you're just one of those maniac, crazy Christians. They're afraid. And it's deeply emotional. The emotions of all of that pain swelling up, all of the joy swelling up in our life, the fears that come into our hearts and our lives, it's deeply emotional. And yes, it is personal. But that's okay. You and I need to understand. In continuing the narrative in verse 35, we'll have to give you a little bit of a backstory. This crowd was moving through, and they had just moved past her, and she thought, this is my only chance. I've got to get into this crowd. I've got to come up from behind. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. I just know that. Because she had thought about and believed what Jesus could do in her heart and in her life. But the reason the crowd was moving through the town, and it was Capernaum where they were when this event took place, was because one of the rulers in the synagogue, one of the spiritual leaders, one of the community leaders, had come to Jesus and he said, my daughter is dying, she is very ill, would you please come and heal my daughter? And so the whole crowd was moving toward Jairus' house. They were moving toward this leader's house when this woman interrupted them by touching the hem of his garment. While he was still speaking to her, the scripture says, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. Your daughter is dead. Devastating news. Things just got worse. You see, not only was it this woman who went through this time of difficulty and needing faith at a time when she was hurting. Jairus was in the same circumstance. Two of them at once. And now these people had come and told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them. And he turned to Jairus. He didn't turn to anybody else. He didn't tell anyone else. He turned to Jairus. And when he turned to Jairus, he said, don't be afraid. The old King James says, fear not. 365 times in the Bible, it is recorded, fear not. Here is one of those fear nots. He says, fear not, don't be afraid, just have faith. That word faith is the word pistas. And it literally means a fidelity of belief, a deep, undying, unwavering commitment of belief. He says, don't be afraid. Just have faith. And you know what Jesus did? He kept walking down the road. When he got to Jairus' house, all these people were crowded in there. He said, everybody out. Everybody go away. Nobody but Jairus, his wife, and Peter, James, and John. Just the three. Everybody else, stay out. Because he didn't need unbelief in his presence. He needed those who believed in his presence. That's why I told him, don't be afraid. Just have faith. The scripture says Jesus went in, touched the young lady, and she arose and sat up and ate a meal. They said she was dead. Jesus said, have faith. You and I need to have that kind of faith as well. He said, don't be afraid. Just have faith. I'd like to leave you with this verse of Scripture, the eternal perspective. I talked briefly about that earlier where Paul said that the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to compare compared to the glory that will be revealed in us one day in heaven. But here's another verse that talks about the eternal perspective. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, the aged apostle writes these words. He says, after you have suffered a little while, our God, who is full of kindness through Christ, will give you His eternal glory. And then I love this statement. He personally will come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray together. Our great God and Father, as we come before you, we pray that your rich blessings would be upon us. Lord, there are those that are suffering right now, and we just ask that you would be their comfort and their peace. 
May they gain that great eternal perspective to know that one day, Lord, you're going to just raise them up. You're going to touch them. And just as this woman, you're going to heal. You're going to make provision. You're going to bring hope even in the midst of death. And so, Lord, we praise you and thank you for the wonderful things you're going to do. May you increase the faith of your people. Dear friend, you may be listening today and you may say, Pastor Howard, I don't know for certain if I died that I'd go to heaven, but I would like to know. Dear friend, if that's you and you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I come before you acknowledging my sin, knowing that I have done and said and thought things for which I am deeply ashamed. And I need your forgiveness. And so right now, I place my faith in your hands. I place my life and my future in your hands. Believing that you died on the cross for me and shed your precious blood to forgive me of my sin. And that they took you down from that cross after you had died and laid you in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, you gloriously and wondrously rose from the dead so that I can have a home in heaven forever with you. And so, Lord Jesus, will you come into my life and be my Savior to forgive me? Be my Lord to lead me and my friend to walk beside me all the days of my life. Dear friends, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, the Scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to thank you for joining us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord watch over you that as you walk through this life, no matter what you face, no matter what you may suffer, you will know that your Redeemer lives and that he will lift you up. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.